Welcome to episode 294 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about as part of this episode at 7, so the word all spelt out, S-E-P-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 294. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandel. I'm a nutritionist and a coach, and I help clients to fully recover. So on today's show, it is a guest interview, and it's been a little while since I've done one of these, and it's a great one to come back with. And my guest today is Victoria Kleinsman. So Victoria is an eating disorder and abuse survivor, a food freedom and body love coach, a speaker, a podcast host, and a writer. And her purpose is to guide you on a journey to discover food freedom, cultivate a loving relationship with your body, and most importantly, fall in love with yourself. She has overcome complex childhood trauma, anorexia, binge eating, bulimia, and a six-year abusive relationship. Today, she is a testament to complete recovery, reveling in food freedom and body positivity, and is on a mission to guide millions of women back home to self-love and intuitive eating. So Victoria is someone who I've recently become aware of, thanks to Julie on my team, putting her on my radar. And I went through her podcast and her Instagram, and I really liked what she's been putting out. And so I wanted to invite her onto the show. So I need to give a trigger warning in front of this one. So Victoria swears, and so there is some of that throughout the episode. But more importantly, Victoria is very open about her story and her background And this includes talking about physical abuse, sexual abuse, rape, and being in an abusive relationship. So Victoria is such a a strength and has such a strength when talking about these things. And it's really powerful to hear her talk about this stuff. But I want to warn you up front that these topics are covered in this episode. In addition to this, we talk about Victoria's history with dieting and how it all started She talks about how this then turned into an eating disorder and how this disorder morphed over the span of 20 years. And we talk about the different aspects of this and how it shifted. We look at her recovery process and what this looked like and how she's reached a place now of full recovery. We talk about how she went from hating her body to loving it and the steps that she took to get there. And this is actually a very practical part of the episode. And we talk a lot about this. And we look at how to deal with binge eating and whether to keep specific foods in the house or to not keep specific foods in the house. So again, a very practical part of the podcast and so much more as part of this episode. Victoria is very easy to chat with and it felt like this was a very flowing conversation. So without any further intro, let's get on with this. Here is my conversation with Victoria Kleinsman. Hey, Victoria. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this and when preparing for today, I've gone through your podcast and there's really just so many things that we could chat about. But what I've decided to do is just create a list of ideas and we'll just see where the conversation goes and probably get to some of them and probably not get to some of them, but that's just how it is. And I think it's a, it's a good starting place. Like, Let's start with you and your story because this is so integral to the work that you now do. So If we go back to the beginning, if you think back to your childhood, what was your relationship like with food as a a young kid and and what was food like in in your household growing up? Yeah, I mean, it always starts from childhood, right? I've not met a single person or I've worked with a single client that this hasn't started from a young age. And so for me, it started, I noticed, and this is all from reflection and from the inner work that I've done and continue to do, which is why I can articulate it in such a clear way. Trust me, it took years to fully understand like how, why, what, when. Yeah. And so looking back, it, I was naturally, I guess, with my personality, a perfectionist anyway, yeah. a high achiever. So from a very young age, I did feel the need to be perfect. I also was the youngest. I only have um, an older sister, but we were quite close. So 18 months between us. So as you can imagine, my mom, you know, was working full time with two young children. As the youngest, I feel like I was given less attention. So I would do anything that I could to get the validation and attention from my mom. I also learned through my mom mirroring back to me through her, through my behavior, through her reactions. If I was a really good girl and did everything I was told, you know, then I got the praise and the validation and the love that little me was seeking. 
Yeah. And I also knew that being fully myself, my true authentic self, I was always told through my parents and grandparents that I was too much. So I was too loud or I was too silly or I was too angry. And so when I would cry, I would get locked outside as a toddler until I was stopped crying and I'll be allowed back in. Yeah. I was left alone a lot in my big emotions. And what I was being taught then, and, and again, my parents and grandparents were only doing what they knew. They, you know, they weren't doing this on purpose. Yeah. I was taught having big emotions, being my true authentic self, it wasn't acceptable. And I would be rejected and basically like literally physically locked outside. So I quickly learned how to people please and to act how my parents and other adults wanted me to act. Um, I also noticed that when we went to friend's house with our parents, I would always want to stay with my mom. I never wanted to do ch child stuff. I always wanted to be with the adults because my mom was always like, you're a mini me, like we're the same. And yeah. she saw me as a best friend. Whereas that might seem nice when we're older, as a child, your mother should be your mother, not your best friend. Yeah. And so what happened there was she would confide in me things that, in all honesty, a child should never know, such as like family affairs and and having to keep secrets and not tell this person, not tell that person. So I soon became like I was responsible for my mum's emotions because when I cried, she would say things like, oh, don't cry. You make me sad if you cry. So all these things that I internalize is like, I am not okay. I'm not okay to be in my emotions. I'm not okay to be my authentic self. So I actually spent quite a lot of time alone as a child. My The only memories I have actually under the age of nine were me just playing by myself. And that was because I felt safer and it was easier to be by myself because I didn't have to pretend to be somebody else. Yeah, That's the backstory as to the lead up to my relationship with food. So my mum throughout my entire life, as long as I can remember, and even still to this day, she's always been a yo-yo dieter. So she would diet, lose weight, binge, put weight on, gain it, start the diet again. So thankfully, she was she never was diagnosed with like an eating disorder. It never went that severe. She definitely had and has disordered eating. Um, yeah. And so when I was nine, she took me to Weight Watchers with her, not because I needed to lose weight as a child, just because we did everything together and I was a mini fur. You were a best friend. Right, exactly. Yeah. So why not bring you know your youngest with her to the Weight Watchers meetings? And I very soon learned, obviously, everyone claps when people lose weight and they're all celebrated. And then when, because you have to get weighed in front of everybody. I don't know if it's the same now. And yeah. then when someone puts weight on, everyone's like, oh no, like, you know, what can you do better? What have you done wrong? Because I wanted to be like my mom with everything because I was a mini her, I wanted to do Weight Watchers. Now, my mom said, you don't need to lose weight, but you can count points as long as you count the ones that I give you. So she gave me enough points to just, I don't know, maintain my weight. I have no idea. Yeah. But because I was a perfectionist, and I wanted to be praised and validated by her and everybody else. Not that I was getting weighed or even allowed to do this. I would secretly just have less points each day. And so it kind of quickly spiraled. Then when my weight got quite low, my mum would, this sounds so bad, but always teach me how to binge eat because after her weigh-in, she would binge eat and then be good again for the entire week for the weigh-in and then binge eat. So I learned that cycle. But when I was about 11... The anorexia started. That was down to puberty happening. And I'm not sure if you've noticed this, Chris. I'll be interested. A lot of my clients, including myself, who have anorexia, they start puberty really early, like at 10, 11 years old. Have you noticed that? I have not noticed that, actually. And that'll be an interesting thing for me to look out for when asking questions connected to this. Like one of the things that I've noticed and I've talked about before is. I think the people who have the capacity to develop anorexia and, and eating disorders more generally, because I think there is a genetic component connected to them, is that their need for energy or their need for food is higher than the average person at baseline. And that is definitely something that I've noticed through having conversations with clients and, and looking back before the eating disorder started and people commenting, like, I used to out eat my brother or... My brother's friends would come around and I'd eat more than them. And, and this had been this thing before the eating disorder started. So that's definitely something that I've 
notice that I have seen anything in the research connected to it, but it would be interesting to now look out for the thing that you've mentioned in terms of sort of early starting of puberty. Yeah, I've just noticed that as a correlation. And also speaking to what you said, actually, Chris, that's so true because I, in terms of having a, a hearty appetite, I was always told, you're, you're greedy. You're greedy, you're greedy, you're greedy. Like, why do you want more? Why can't you have just what everyone else wants? And I was a very active kid. I, I've rode horses since I was five. I started gymnastics at a young age. I had a lot of energy. I was, you know, always told I was too much. I obviously burnt a lot. So that was interesting that you brought that up. Um, so the anorexia started as I was starting puberty. So I think it was a combination of me being so scared that my body was changing and I was growing into a woman when I was freaking 11. Yeah. Like I wasn't ready to step into that. Yeah. Also, because I'd been like almost like a mother to my mom my entire life, I just wanted to be just taken care of. Like, can someone please just like take care of me? And if I'm sick, this is obviously all through reflection. I didn't know this at the time. Yeah. If I'm sick, I'll get taken care of. And also the perfectionism as well. If I can like lose weight perfectly and just do it to the extreme and like be the best at it, yeah. it's a combination of all of those things. And I remember watching a movie. I actually watched this a few years ago because I wanted to reminisce and just be with my younger self. It's an old movie called The Perfect Body. And it's about a gymnast who develops bulimia and it doesn't end well. The movie doesn't end well. Okay. So the movie's intention, I'm sure, is to stop people from developing eating disorders. For some reason, I watched that movie and wanted to be like her. So I remember it like it was yesterday. I know I know where I was. I know like what day it was, what the weather was like. And I just decided in my head, I'm just going to stop eating. Yeah. And I did. And I actually don't think that's as bizarre as, as you're saying, because I think there's been research looking at memoirs and recovery memoirs and actually that they can be quite triggering for people because of the fact that people often read them as, as almost like a, a how-to manual and so much of what's focused on in those memoirs and I imagine it's the same within the the film that you watched is actually of the disorder of descending and getting worse and worse but like nothing of the actual recovery process. And there may be like in often memoirs, there's like an epilogue where there's like two pages of like, and then I recovered and, but giving absolutely no detail of what happened. And there's all of this focus on the actual eating disorder. And even when someone's not intending to do it, whether this is in a book or in a film, there can be a lot of glorifying of that. And especially glorifying to someone who is a, who is a, a young impressionable teenager whose mind thinks very differently to someone who may be an adult. And so, yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all that you you said like this had this impact, even if that wasn't the filmmaker's intention. Yeah. And thank you for reflecting that, Chris, because that is actually so true. You're right. The, the whole entire movie, you was right. At the very end, she kind of started to get better for like 10 minutes. She like ate a meal or something. Yeah. It was almost like you said a how-to have an eating disorder. And especially because I related to the gymnastics and I was really good at the gymnastics, obviously, because I had to be the best at everything in order yeah. to prove myself to get validation and love. I wanted to copy her. So I just decided without telling anybody that I was just going to stop eating. I managed to hide it for probably about six to eight weeks. But then I used to wear like three jumpers to go to school and like try and pad myself out. And then my mum noticed and I remember her like dragging me to the doctors. I was in complete denial. I handed a leaflet of anorexia nervosa and I remember like my heart stopping and me just being like no this like I was just in denial I, I thought everyone was crazy they don't know what they're talking about I know what I'm doing I'm in control of this I wasn't in control of that because that I have the gen genetic component to anorexia the yeah. migration response is switched off switched on when I got to a certain low weight for me not eating became so easy didn't yeah. even want to eat. Like I just wanted to move, not eat. I even restricted water. So I had a severe reaction to anything inside my stomach. So I don't know how I'm alive to this day. Honestly, I used to allow myself 250 milliliters of water a day. That's it. Until my mom like discovered and then forced me. And so I actually recovered and in quotes, air quotes recovered because I quote weight restored over yeah. four years, but I didn't because I was still underweight for my natural body size, which is now 
overweight on the BMI scale. We'll go into that later, I'm sure. Yeah, I would love to get some more details on some of the stuff that you've yes. already said. So I want to pick up on the anorexia piece, but the thing that keeps coming up in my mind, like, I want to hear more about your sister's relationship with your mom, just because of um, mm-hmm. how you described what happened with you and, and how well this was with you, what happened in terms of in terms of her. And I, and I also guess that this is personal. And if you don't want to share stuff about your sister, I understand that as well. But yeah, I just want to, did she get out of this unscathed? Did she have issues in terms of her relationship with food? That is a great question, Chris, and I'm happy to talk about anything. So interestingly enough, or not so interestingly enough, my sister was a daddy's girl. Okay. Yeah. So that is obviously quite interesting. So quite close together, 18 months older than me she is. And she was a daddy's girl. And my dad, great man, did the best he could. He was quite emotionally unavailable a lot. So he was there. I mean, he worked a lot and they both worked full time in the police. That's how they met. Um, But he wasn't really emotionally there. It was always asking mom, like my mom wore the trousers. She was like, you know, this kind of overruled my dad a lot. So my sister was daddy's girl and I was a mummy's girl. So my sister actually, she had one episode where she tried the Atkins diet because my mum was doing it and she got really sick, not sick with eating disorder, just her body was like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, where are the carbohydrates? She got really sick and after that, she just never dieted again. Yeah. She did get married really young. So she got married at like 19. Okay. For the first time, it might have been early 20s. It was really young. I remember that. Um, she's with someone else now, but so and I since speaking to her, she left the house as early as she could because of my disorder and everyone paying attention to me. And it was a really difficult household to grow up in because it was always arguments around food and forcing me to eat and everyone paying attention to me. And my mum was on depression tablets because of me. And so my sister was affected and she has shared that she did kind of want to leave the house as quick as possible, but she didn't really have any issues with food. Body image, yes, because my mum used to pick herself apart in front of the mirror, fat shame people walking down the street because she had had that conditioning too. So my sister was also really ashamed and kind of obsessed with her appearance, but thankfully she never really did the whole food control thing. Yeah. And I guess it's interesting and we will never know for sure, but this again can speak to the genetic component of it. Like she went on Atkins and had a very terrible experience very quickly with that and was like, never again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really true of many people. Like many people try dieting once and it's like, I'm never doing this ever again. Mm -hmm. There are many people who just don't have the capacity to develop an eating disorder. And when I say the capacity, I'm not talking about they don't have the willpower or Mm -hmm. they don't have the determination. It's more just like, it is really uncomfortable to be in that situation. Like you talked about when I turned on that eating disorder switch, actually there was calmness or there was like it became easy to do this. Like if I reflect on me, I don't have the capacity to develop an eating disorder. Like if I get hungry, I'm not fun to be around. I don't enjoy being that in that place. And so it just, I'm not going to go down that route. Like I could have lots of different self-destructive behaviors, but having an eating disorder is not one that would happened to me just because of how uncomfortable and enjoyable it is for me to be in that state. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can speak to the fact that your sister had some biological things that were different to you in terms of your capacity to develop this. Definitely. And my mum didn't have the capacity either. I'm guaranteed she would have, right, with all the diet she went on and the weight that she lost. Yeah. So it's very true. And I'm glad you brought that up, Chris, because a lot of people I know, and this was before I got into the work that I was doing, used to make kind of half arse comments like oh I wish I was anorexic or you know like when they were struggling to lose weight and I'm like yes. you fucking do not you never wish that you have the genetics of anorexia trust me because when yes when the anorexia response gets switched on like I was saying there's no willpower at all there's no willpower involved because your biology drives you not to eat so yes. it's nothing to do with how strong you are or how much willpower you have or how successful you are it's literally genetic so I want to make that so clear because if someone is struggling with let's say dieting and restricting and they're kind of unfortunately wishing that it was easy you don't want it to be easy trust me because you'll probably die and then recovery is the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life but worth every fucking second of it 
Yeah, for sure. And and I will say as well that where you say it's easy, that is true. And there is also a, a honeymoon period where yeah. at some point all of the the malnutrition and the depletion and the energy debt that you've got into does then start to to catch up with you. And so, yeah, what initially felt easy now does not feel easy in any way. Yeah, because a part of you, anorexia, as we know by, you know, Tabitha Farrar explains this beautifully, it was adapted for the adaptly famine like prognosis, like back in the day when we were cavemen or women or whatever. And yeah. so it was only supposed to happen for a short period of time. And we're talking weeks, maybe months at the most. So then when we did reach the land with an abundant amount of food and then everyone feasted together, not binge ate, feasted together, yeah. the genetic response would have got switched off and everyone would have gone on their merry way. However, because in today's world, we have supermarkets all around us, it's it's obviously there's food everywhere, but we're choosing not to eat because we're in the eating disorder. The longer we're in the eating disorder for, your body is starving and it's yeah. malnourished. And yes, the genetic response is on, so it's, you know, easier not to eat than someone who hasn't got that. But you're right, there's a huge biological aspect as well that is driving you to eat because you are starving. But then you've got the brain wired with an eating disorder. There's lots going on, but the recovery process is the same for anybody. Yeah, yeah definitely. And so, yeah, let's come back to your recovery. So when, and we'll start with the first attempt at recovery with, with the anorexia piece. So what did that look like? Did you go inpatient? Were you outpatient? What was going on in terms of that recovery process? I was outpatient and thankfully I was very blessed and I had a horse like that we brought with our own money with what my grandma gave us when we were younger, but we had a horse. My sister had lost interest. Yeah. I loved the horse more than I loved the eating disorder. Thank God. Because my mum would literally say, if you do not eat that, we're selling the horse. And she meant it. Yeah. So I would sit there and scratch my face, like I would scream, I'd run into the road, but I had to eat a lot of frigging food, like every hour of the day. I had to have these 1,000 calorie weight gain milkshakes like three times a day on top of all the food. Oh my God, it was horrible. I hated every single body. I hated my mom. I thought I did. I hated everyone who would force me to eat, as you can imagine. But yeah. thankfully, I loved my horse more because otherwise I probably wouldn't be here, to be honest, or I'd, I would have gone in inpatient. Yeah. So I did gain weight over the course of you know a few years and then I was discharged, like you're recovered, you're at a healthy BMI, off you go. And then off I went. But then up from that point, up until the age of 30, so now I'm 37 almost as we record this. Okay. So for however many years that was, what, another 15 years, I was in bulimia through having catastrophic binges because I was still underweight without realizing it and just thought I had lack of willpower and why can't I restrict like I used to and what's wrong yeah. with me? And so I'd spent 15 years binging my face off, purging through excessive, dangerous laxative abuse because I thankfully couldn't make myself physically vomit. God, I tried. And an exercise addiction. And that was until I was 30. And in between that, I had a, a six-year-long very abusive relationship where I was hit, raped, like abused daily, didn't go to my sister's wedding. That was a lot. And I think that was all contributing to, of course, the bulimia. And then started my healing when I was 30. So I'll, I'm sure you've got many questions before I continue how I healed. Yeah, I did. And look, I just want to say that's a lot for you to, for you to go through, for anyone to go through. And so, yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking hearing that that was your life was like for for that amount of time and that you've had to go through all of those things. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. It's, it's made me the woman I am today though. And honestly, I'm so great. It sounds weird, but I'm so grateful for what I have gone through because I can only take my clients to what I've been to and what I understand. So if I see all of this pain now as my power and I can help other people and it, it's so worth it. So I am grateful, even though it was, yeah, it was really hard. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And uh, I've had many clients say the same thing of like, okay, I now feel like I have this, this superpower. Like I've recovered from an eating disorder. Life is a lot easier now when there's a struggle with a relationship with work or with whatever. Like it helps to put some real perspective on things. And so, yeah, when there must be definitely struggles that come up in your life now, whether that's relationships, whether that's work, like it happens, we're humans. And you also have that point of reference of like, well, it's not like it was when I was in that abusive relationship. 
and no. there must be some real some real strength that comes from that honestly it's almost like i have this energy of like bring it the fuck on because nobody can abuse me like i'll abuse anymore because my worthiness i know who how worthy i am now so nobody can hurt me like he hurt me nobody can hurt me like the eating disorder hurt me so yeah i kind of feel very powerful and empowered because i've overcome those things so yeah. it's really cool actually and recovering from an eating disorder although it probably is the hardest thing you might ever do like you said it sets you up for a life of empowerment and responsibility and because when we recover we need three things we need courage we need commitment and we need tolerance because of course and you speak about this a lot chris we need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You cannot recover from an eating disorder without being uncomfortable and facing your fears for a long time. Yep. Totally. And I agree. And I would say those three things you don't work out first and then you do recovery. Like no. those three things come about by going through recovery. And that is the, the symptom or the end result of being of going through recovery. Like you get more and more courageous by doing the challenging things when you don't necessarily feel ready to do the challenging thing. Oh, we'll never feel ready, right? And that's why support's yeah. really important because someone like you or like myself or all the other incredible recovery coaches out there, someone to hold your hand and actually say, it's okay, how you're feeling is normal and you can also do this and here's what you're going to do. It's like, it's everything. I couldn't have recovered without support, no way. Yeah, and so during that 15-year period obviously you now recovered from anorexia and i'm doing sort of air quotes here what did you think was going on in terms of your relationship with food and the pattern that you were in like how were you in your mind categorizing what was happening i honestly thought it was normal because everyone around me not to the extreme that i was doing it because yeah. i was an extremist you know but i just thought honestly that you were born so therefore when you're born you spend your entire life trying to be thin and stay thin that's the point to life, then you die, full stop, honestly. And so I thought it was normal, but I also thought because people weren't binging like I was. So yeah, you know, my mum would diet, she would like binge eat a bit, but I would go like, I'm talking 20,000 calories in a matter of hours. And I'll be so physically full, like I literally could hardly breathe and I couldn't move because I was so full. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like, no one else does this shit. And now I know that there are other people out there who experience this. Yeah. I would, you've probably heard this before, I would like put stuff in the bin and put washing up liquid over it because I know, because I've done it many times, go to the bin again an hour later and try and get the stuff back out the bin and eat it again. Like I thought I was like an animal. Yeah. So I kept a lot of it secret, especially the purging behaviors are kept secret. The binging especially, I'd only do that in secret. I'm in the car, in the broom cupboard at work. Like when I was alone, I'd make excuses not to go out so I could sit and binge. Honestly, I just thought it was normal because people did that, but not to the extreme that I did. So I didn't really know that I had an eating disorder, as crazy as that sounds. Yeah. And so what was then the, if there was one, what was the, the pivotal moment or moments where you, where there was a realization of this isn't normal and this isn't how I want to continue spending my days. I will, what happened to awaken you to this? It was really cool, actually, because when I was 30, I went to Egypt on holiday, yep. met my now husband, Bouter, who's Dutch, which is why I live in the Netherlands, fell in love very quickly, moved in with him within like three months of like knowing him, still fully much in eating disorder. Yeah. I don't know how and why I did that. I was following my heart. I believe in like a higher power, something just that was written in the stars that I was supposed to come to live with him. Yeah. So I did. And then I really started to realize that I'm not normal because him and his family have, even to this day, have never mentioned anything to do with body image, with weight gain or weight loss, even through pregnancies in the family. They eat normally. They don't restrict. And I, so I was in a different environment where I was like, oh my God, this is like a whole new world. Like, what is this? No one's obsessed with what they're eating, what they had for dinner, what for breakfast, what body size they are. And so it really shone a light on what I was doing and my family was doing just on a, like a condensed down level. Wasn't normal. And yeah. so with living with him and he cared about me and he's like, why are you treating yourself that way? Why are you not nourishing yourself? Because 
I would eat and binge, of course, but it would be on the processed food. And then I would skip meals to try and compensate. And he's like, well, don't you want to like take care of your body? And that's the first time in my entire life where anything to do with food was actually reflected back to me of like actually being able to take care of me. And that's the first inclination I had towards what self-care and what self-love might look like. And then I started listening to podcasts because he was a personal development junkie. Yeah. And I kind of just started copy reading books and stuff. As I was learning about personal development, I was still in fully much in the eating disorder. And there was one time where I started my own brownie business over here, brownie bakery business. Okay. I was binge eating all all of my stock, which is funny now, but it wasn't profitable because I was making all these brownies, trying to freeze them to stop myself from eating them. But then when um, Valter would go upstairs and have a shower, I would literally frantically, like a drug addict, go in the freezer, like shove the microwave, uh, the brownies in the microwave, go in the toilet and like eat them all and then be like, and then I kept doing that. And then I literally remember just falling onto the floor one day and being like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I can't take laxatives anymore. Like my body's just completely broken. I'm swollen. I hate the way my body looks. I just was like, I cannot do this anymore. I had my first and hopefully last true panic attack where I couldn't breathe through tears and like gasping for breath. I was so afraid of my own thoughts. I seriously wanted to check myself into a psychiatric hospital because I couldn't be with myself anymore. I was done. I didn't want to commit suicide, but I just couldn't be me anymore. It was too fearful and too anxiety provoking. And that's where my recovery started. I was listening to some podcasts that were kind of around intuitive eating. And that's the first I'd heard of that. Yeah. So I dove more into that, hired my first coach through this intuitive eating podcast, who probably wasn't the ideal coach looking back, but she's got me started on the journey. And then since then, I've always had a coach. I still have a coach now, investing in programs, mentorships. I, of course, have my own certifications now, psychology and coaching, yeah, nutrition. And it's just been a journey of getting to know myself and understanding why it started in the first place. A lot of inner child work, like going back to little me and actually understanding that, oh my gosh, she was just trying to get validation and ultimately love. And it's not her fault. And she is enough as as she is. A lot of that type of work, obviously the behavioral work as well, like unrestricted eating for the rest of my life, which is the best thing ever to live in complete food freedom. Of course, I thought I would eat chocolate for the rest of my life, like every day for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and in between. I did for the first month or so. And then after that, I remember being like, I want a green shake. What is wrong with me? That's interesting. And I kept allowing and allowing and doing all the body image work. And then you just kind of end up in a recovered place where your values change. I no longer valued appearance. I no longer valued values such as determination and control and discipline. My values started to change to like love and acceptance and freedom. So it's kind of a journey and I am where I am now, still on a journey, always learning more about myself, but so grateful to be where I am. Yeah. And again, there is so many things that I want to, I want to say connected to what you have just shared. And I guess one of the things I would say is yes, doing the recovery work in terms of eating more food and, and giving yourself more permission to, to eat and doing that nutritional rehabilitation really does make a huge difference. And I don't think it gets you to where you got to. I think all of the extra work that you've done on top of that is yeah. so so necessary to then yeah to really start to shift your values and it's not that nutritional rehabilitation can't start to shift your values but again i think there's another layer of work that happens on top of that to really cement that and to to really make a difference there is because nutritional what the word whatever phrase you just use that sounded excellent nutritional rehabilitation Nutritional rehabilitation, exactly. Getting back up to your natural set point weight, which is scary because I didn't know what mine was because I dieted since I was like nine. Yeah. Is absolutely crucial because your brain can actually work. Then you have the capacity to actually build neuropathways and rewire your brain from the eating disorder. You can do the body image and self-love work. And that's the hardest thing though, Chris, isn't it? Because the first step is to eat more food when your whole entire body and self doesn't want to eat more food. 
Yes. You have to do the hardest thing first and then you can do all the other work. And that's why a lot of people like relapse because they do the hardest bit first and they're like immediately expect to be okay mentally and like their body and like, okay, well, restriction's better then because I've gained weight and now I hate myself and I have an eating disorder mentally. But you have to just be, again, committed and tolerate these uncomfortable, really painful feelings with the right support. And then when you do the underlying work, that's what true recovery is. Because you and I agree that every single person can fully recover from any eating disorder. I fully believe that. Yeah, me too. Again, what you just said there in terms of having that challenging point where you were going through it, you've gained some weight, it doesn't feel like there's been some upside connected to this and you think like, why would I do this? Let me just retreat back to what I know. Like that again speaks to the importance of of coaching and support to have someone there who's able to say like what you're going through at this time at this stage is completely normal. It's it's normal that actually there still hasn't been a lot of those changes in terms of how you're you're thinking. And also for someone to be able to point out the bright spots. Because I think what often happens is there can be this very broad brushstroke sweeping generalizations of like nothing got better. And then when I start to ask specific questions and get into it, it's like, actually, yeah, my sleep has got better. I'm now waking up less in the night to to urinate. I'm noticing that I've got a little bit better energy or I actually feel really tired, but I'm sleeping better. Like there could be all of these different things that often just get not even thought about or put to the side or whatever. And so really illuminating these things and saying, okay, look, you are actually noticing some upside here. And yes, I get that this is really uncomfortable and it's really challenging and there are benefits that are are here already. And you've run this other experiment for, for 15 years. Like you know what your life is like when you do those things. Like the data is in, that is what happens. And if you want that for the rest of your life, that is what is going to be there. Let's run a different experiment and give it some time and then see and see what happens when you do things differently. Yes, we get restriction and amnesia, don't we? Yeah. We only remember the really good things about restriction, like a thinner body, the praise from the external world, feeling in control, because eating disorders are created for a reason. They're not created just for shits and giggles for you to suffer or like whatever. He served you at one point. Yeah. So it's understanding why was the eating disorder serving you and perhaps how is it still serving you to some degree and yes. understanding that and then, like you said, being able to look at it with clarity and say, okay, well, oh, I can go back and I already know what that's like. That's yeah. why I've perhaps paid thousands for coaching. That's perhaps why I'm listening to all these things and working on myself. There's a reason someone's listening to this or watching this or working with you or working with me. Because where they were was hell and they wanted different. So to have someone to keep reflecting that back to the person and like you said, to remind them that you've come so far. Give me a bullet point list now of how far you've come since we first met or since you started recovery. There's so many growth that we don't see because again, with the anxiety, with the restriction amnesia, we're just trying to, we want to be out of the discomfort. We want to retreat back to what it was giving us, but they're not that person anymore. You know, all of us, we grow and we evolve. So we can't ever go back anyway because we've outgrown that version of ourselves. So the only way is to keep going forward because why would you 50 or 80% recover when you can 100% recover? Yeah, totally. And actually the discomfort is the point of recovery in many ways. It's then learning that, okay, this thing can be uncomfortable and I can still make a choice that is pro-recovery. And I could notice that this discomfort lasts for an hour or two hours and then naturally goes down over its own accord. Or I can notice when I do these things to support my nervous system or to get co-regulation or whatever it may be, that this helps me. Like this is you learning how to deal with all of these different aspects of being an, an adult in a very intense fashion because of of what you're going through as part of recovery. But I think if you had a pill and you just took that, like, of course, I would give that to everyone. That would be what I would want. I think with that not being available, there is a huge amount of upside. And we talked about this earlier, like, of going through that process. Like, mm-hmm. that is where you grow. That is where you get the strength. That's where you get those superpowers is by noticing that, hey, I can do this 
really hard thing of eating the food even though it feels really uncomfortable or taking the time off exercise even though it feels really uncomfortable. Yeah, and feeling perhaps for the first time really because when we're a child, if we've um, suffered trauma and trauma doesn't have to be what I used to think trauma was, like being locked in a room, beaten and starved every day as a child, It can be emotional stuff like I experienced, like enmeshment with my mom, feeling responsible for making her happy, my dad not being there emotionally and being unattached to that. So whenever we experience that, those feelings, and we don't know how to feel them and we're alone in our big feelings, our head kind of says, hey, come and hang out with me because it's safer up here. So we start to live in our heads because, of course, when we feel, it's a visceral feeling in our body. So myself included until I started recovery and many of my clients, they live in a, in their head, overthinking, not truly feeling, resisting feelings. So part of recovery, like you've mentioned, co-regulating your nervous system, breathing through it, being in your body, and maybe for the first time, they're actually feeling shame. I mean, shame is usually at the root of most of it. That yeah. can be overwhelming when you've never felt that before. But to have someone to, again, hold your hand metaphorically through It's okay to just feel the shame and cry and feel what you're feeling, be there for a younger version of you and just let it go. And then you're alive. You've not combust into flames. It's okay. And then once you have one piece of evidence that you can feel a really painful feeling and be okay, it's easier then to just keep doing it over and over again, which is all part of recovery as well. Definitely. And this is the thing that I'm so encouraging of people when they're, trying to get started he's like let's make some change like you've got to get out of the realm of of what if thinking and all these theories and maybe this will happen and maybe that'll happen into let's actually do this like let's have you eat the more food and see what genuinely happens and yes it can be uncomfortable but we have then a real life experience as opposed to all of the theories and the made-ups of what could potentially happen and it's impossible to convince someone when we're just looking at the realm of theory like i can have long conversation with someone and it doesn't change anything what changes yeah. someone is is taking the action and getting to experience that thing and and recognizing that that actually didn't go very well and i'm still standing and i'm still here and i was able to get through it yeah that's the part when i don't want to say everyone takes this in order to change, I did. But until, and I'm curious what your views on this are actually, Chris, I see, and I see in my clients too, until the pain of staying where you are is worse than the fear of the unknown, people will stay stuck where they are and they will read about recovery and they will listen to countless podcasts, but they won't actually do any action steps, which is the most important. So I'm curious, like, have you had that experience where people come to you where they are at rock bottom and the fear of the unknown is actually less worse if that's even an english saying it's worse than yeah. pain of being where they are yeah i totally agree with you on that and then i guess the sad thing that i see is that what i or someone else as a an objective witness we think of like oh this has got to be rock bottom often mm-hmm. is not rock bottom and this is the real sad part with eating disorders is that often the worst thing gets the worse your ability to have awareness around how bad Mm -hmm. things are like it's really the clients where things are at their absolute worst where it can be the most difficult for them to see this really needs some some attention and so it almost feels like there needs to have some momentum going the other way for them to start to realize like holy shit like this is a really bad diet diet mm-hmm. place to be in. And I think that for me is one of the saddest things that is the fact that it can be so hard to see how bad things have got as things have, have got worse. Like I, I often use the analogy because people talk about not, not being sick enough. And I'm like, well, you don't have to wait to some point of being sick. Like if your sink in your kitchen was busted and, and was flooding the kitchen, you don't wait until the whole house is flooded before you say, let me turn off the thing in the kitchen. And unfortunately for a lot of people, they are in a situation where the whole house is flooded and yet they think it is just the kitchen. Yeah, that is a great analogy because people with eating disorders, they tend to be sufferers. Speaking for myself, I used to think that unless I was suffering or struggling at something, 
then I was doing something wrong. So yeah. even in the depths of it, and they know it's not necessarily thriving behavior, the struggle and the suffering that they're in, it's so normal for them to be suffering in life. They don't see how bad it is. Yeah. You're right. It's helpful to show them with um, comparison can be helpful sometimes, not always to say like what you're, let's say currently eating is not enough for like a one year old child. Yeah. To really kind of give factual information that could shock them to understand like, okay, wow, I'm really just surviving. And therefore, do you want to thrive? Because if you do, let's go. Because what I've noticed is when I started my recovery, I would move from the place of, is this bad enough to change? Yes, it was. Now, now I know my worth. When I'm changing something, I don't go to the point of, or the question, is it bad enough to change? I go to, is this good enough to stay? Nope. So I'm going to change it because your worthiness increases and you realize that I deserve better than that. But until you get to that place, we kind of think we deserve to suffer for some reason. Acclimatize to the status quo. And so I know the status quo. I know what that's like, but this change, I don't know what that's like. And so there's the sort of better the devil you know, because I don't know what could happen. And also it really impairs your ability to envisage something better. And so to be able to say that there you thought recovery is completely possible, you could have all of these different things in terms of your relationship with food, your relationship with body, exercise, etc. If this has been going on for 10, 20, 30 years, that thing can sound like a pipe dream. And I like, that's just, that's not on the table. For, that's not going to happen. And so the goal is to, as I said, it's, it's not about convincing someone, but to have someone start to see that that is truly, truly possible for them. How many times have you had a potential client say to you, I'm going to be the only one that recovery won't work for? And I said yeah. that with a smile because I said the same thing. You know, I didn't have a choice though, because well, like everything's a choice. But I was at rock bottom and I was like, I am done. I have no idea how to get out of this. I just know I cannot continue the way I was. And so people come to me and say, of course, their biggest fear is what if this doesn't work for them? And what if everyone else can do it, but they can't? And I lovingly reflect back and say, okay, you're a human. Check, check. You have a brain. Check. You have a nervous system. Okay, you 100% can recover because we wire your brain, we change your nervous system through bioregulation and show yourself it's safe to be in your body. All the Yeah, it takes work. It's impossible for you not to be able to change if you are human. And so that gives a little bit of hope. And I say, all you have to do before you start recovery is believe that I believe that you can recover. I do not expect that you believe that you can recover yet. Of course you don't because you've not got any evidence that you can because Maybe you've tried and been in inpatient treatment centers seven times, you know. All you need to do is, I know it's a big ass, so trust me, trust the process, believe that I believe, and I guarantee recovery is possible. And so it helps the coach, whoever the person's working with, it helps that the coach is fully invested. Yeah. Obviously, boundaries and stuff to protect the professional relationship is fully invested in the person because belief is really powerful as well in coaching. Definitely. And that's the thing. Like I'm I'm in the same way as you. Like I am a full advocate for full recovery. I believe everyone can get there. And I only gonna work with people where I'm gonna bring that belief there and be like, cool. No, I even when you are doubting this process, even when you think this isn't gonna work for you, I'm gonna be the one who's like, No, full recovery is, is possible. You need to do these things and that is gonna get you there. It's not it's not a if you do these things, maybe it will happen. It's a, if you do these things, it will happen. And I feel very confident in that of like, no, this is is a certainty that this is inevitable if you do these things. Yeah. Amen to that. So one thing that we didn't cover as you went through your story was obviously you said you were in this abusive relationship for, for six years. And then you said, oh, I went on a trip to, to Egypt and met the new person. So how did you get out of that abusive relationship? And the reason I want to ask this is, a lot of times I think of an eating disorder as similar to being in an abusive relationship. I think there's like this grooming stage that happens in the beginning that that, that makes you think, oh, this is amazing, this is wonderful. And then you get into a situation that you feel very challenged in being able to extricate yourself from. And you've got, in a sense, this thing in, in your mind telling you all the ways that you're 
not a very good person and why you have to keep to these particular rules and standards and all of these things that is, is very similar to an abusive relationship. So yeah, tell me how you got out of what you were, what you were in. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, I left in the middle very briefly for a couple of weeks and I'll briefly explain that and I'll explain why I went back, which is also very common in eating disorders and in domestic abuse. Yes. So about two and a half years in, I'm going to go quite graphic. So when he used to hit me, he didn't used to hit my face because obviously in public people would see. Um, this particular time he went crazy. I almost died because he strangled me and passed out. He did hit my face. And so it was very obvious I was being abused. So we lived in a high apartment at the time. So he took my phone, locked me in the apartment for a couple of days so I couldn't leave the apartment so no one could see me. This is the first time I left. And then one of, on the third day, he was on the phone when he was leaving. He forgot to lock the door. And then I just sat there. I heard him drive off. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the only chance I have to leave. So yeah. I got my dog, who was my little savior. I had a little toy poodle at the time. It was also horrible because she was so scared of him and swear words and all of that. It was The only way he would get me to react was if he held her out the window. And, yeah, that he was that type of guy. Because I learned to disassociate. So during the abuse... I would just like leave my body and just like go limp and like just not be there emotionally, of course, because it was traumatic. So I learned to deal with that quite well. But then when he needed a reaction, he would do something like that, which definitely got a reaction because she was my little savior. Yeah. So I took her, ran down the street. The first thing I came to was a hairdresser's. I mean, God knows what I must have looked like, the sight of me. And I I was walked into the hairdresser and I was like, can I use your phone? Like, you know, I can't speak. I'm crying, like trying to say, can I use your phone to call the police? So they yeah. were like, give me the phone. Um, I called the police. Hadn't spoke to my parents in years, like since I'd been with him. My mom was on holiday. My dad was on holiday. They weren't together. They divorced. I forgot that in my childhood, by the way. That was a big thing. <laughs> Separating loads of times and they eventually divorced. That was a big deal. My mom came back straight away and then I went to live with my mom for a couple of weeks got a restraining order on him, went to court. He got ple he pleaded guilty for battering me, got a suspended sentence. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, he would stop following me in bushes. And I knew it was him. And then he came out of the bush one time when I was at the horse stables. And he was like, please don't pull, please, please, please. I have a certificate. Look, I've been to an anger management course. Look at my certificate. I've got better. Like I promise I'm going to get better. Believed everything he said. Still, I have no idea how I was still so brainwashed. Believed that I'd gone on this anger management course. Long story short, got back with him. It all started again. So, you know, that was literally a matter of weeks. So I didn't leave for very long. Went back to him two and a half years later. It wasn't anything that he particularly did. I was 25 at that time. His son had come to live with us. He had a, a young son who was six and he came to live with us. And his son kept getting out of bed like every five minutes. And it was nothing against the son. It was just something really annoyed me. Because he said, if you come downstairs one more time, I'll turn the TV off. And it was like 50 times and it was the same thing was said, nothing was done. So I just walked upstairs, unplugged the TV and walked back down and just sat there. He looked at me and I wasn't scared for some reason. I wasn't scared what the consequences were. And for the first time ever, he didn't abuse me. It was as if he like something shifted in my energy. I was just done with it. And I just took an action. Then yeah. in my head... I was asking myself, what are you doing with your life? Vic, look around you. This is your life. You're 25 years old. What are you doing? And at yeah. that point, I decided to leave. So I would text my mum in the bathroom and he used to have a screwdriver to open the lock to try and check up what I was doing in the bathroom. So I was secretly trying to text my mum. I know you don't believe me. I promise I'm going to leave. Like, please, can you come around on this day? I'm going to have all my stuff together because he used to take his kid to school. Yeah. This day came around a week later. He took his kid to school. My mum came round. We started putting all my stuff in a car. This is like a soap. He came back because he forgot something. Gosh. Came back mid me and my mum like basically leaving. I've never seen him cry so much in my entire life. So he was really upset and I'm so sorry. My mum, I swear to God, she was going to kill him or something. She didn't. She was a police officer. She was very angry, as you can imagine. Yeah. We left. Never saw him again. Changed my number, got the training order back on. Never saw him again. Started to rebuild my life. A month later, the bailiffs come knocking at my mum's door, which is debt collecting people. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, Miss McDonald, that was my name at the time. You've got 10,000 worth of debt in your name. We've come in to pick your car and your house stuff. And I was like, what? So he'd put all the bills and stuff in my name, got his daughter to sign it. My word against his, there's nothing we could do. We went to the Citizen Advice Bureau, all these legal things. I had to, so my mum paid it and I've paid it her all back. So then I had all this money in debt. I had no job. I hated my body. I'd gained a lot of weight at that point. Started from scratch and I got myself a job working with horses, paid my mum back, started the gym. That's when the obsession with the exercise and everything came in because it was my thing. Yeah. I felt empowerment being strong because I could physically defend myself then. Not that I needed to at that point. Well, that's how I left. I know that's the story, but it was. Yeah. And in the middle, I left and went back. I think I went back because honestly, suffering was my comfort zone. Like you were saying, it's what I knew. So I just went, ran back to what I already knew. And I believed that he had changed and he hadn't, of course. Oh, man. That's so, so sad to hear that after two and a half years, you had this opportunity to get out. And then you endured another two and a half years after that. And yeah, I think. It's so common. Not I think, like it is. It is so common. This happens with abusive relationships. It's got nothing to do with like you and you should have known better and all of that. It's just like this is unfortunately the the brainwashing that that happens and and how you you think of yourself and your self worth and what you deserve yeah. and all of those those things. And so you know people stay in in horrible situations that objectively from everyone looking in is like what are you doing and yet for that person it makes sense um and it's the same with an eating disorder it is i also wanted to be paid you know i mentioned in the anorexia i wanted to be taken care of mm-hmm. this person albeit shit care take shit caretaking yeah he i had no responsibility because he paid for everything. Well, clearly he didn't. But <laughs> in theory. <laughs> in theory, he paid for everything. I wasn't allowed to work. So technically I had no responsibility. And as a child, I felt very responsible for my mom a lot. Yeah. I was taken care of in quotes. So I, you know, so they were, and also my worth was at an all time low. So I understand now why I chose that relationship. I was also unconsciously looking for a strong male figure because my dad wasn't yeah. he was very, you know weak and passive kind of more in his feminine and this guy was the opposite he was in the wounded masculine so he was very angry very quite masculine and over empowering so I understand now why back then it was just I guess I thought that's just what I deserved and I was trying to find some need to be met somewhere although of course it wasn't serving me at all yeah yeah, hearing your explanation, it makes it makes total sense. Yeah. And so, for you, when did the idea of becoming a coach come to mind? Like, obviously, you, should, you then went through your own recovery. You've done a lot of work, whether that be with different coaches or therapists or whatever it may be. And so, when did you start thinking, okay, actually, this is where I want to take my life and what I want to do? Yeah, well, I started off with my coach, like I shared, like started off with my recovery with kind of in, intuitive eating, which did benefit me a lot, but there was some a lot of aspects missing, such as mental restriction, which I was doing a lot of. Yeah. And at the same time as that, I was um because I'd stopped the brownie business because I was eating all the all the stock. Yeah. I started cleaning student toilets and showers because I can't speak Dutch. I can a bit now, but I couldn't then. So yeah. I was just cleaning. The benefit to that was I could listen to stuff all day in my earphones because it was just a manual job. So I started yeah. to listen to like health type podcasts because I was still in recovery. So I was still a bit obsessed with if I could just get my health right and my nutrition right and still get my eating perfect, which is disordered, yeah. I would be better. And I came across a podcast who had a guest on who was sharing that she has this. It's called the Institute of Transformational Nutrition. I don't know if you've heard of it. I don't know that one. So I sat and when I was listening, I was like, oh my God, that's what I can do. I want to help people. I want to help myself because honestly, about 85% of recovery coaches that I've spoke to started off as a nutritionist. As a nutritionist, I think I've kind of said this on the podcast before, if if I had known about psychology when I was younger, I would have definitely gone in Mm. in that direction and I, I just didn't. And so I started as a nutritionist and I'm actually really grateful that that's the case because it gave me a very good understanding of physiology and of the work that we now do really understanding physiology is 
hugely important. Like if it was yeah. just a psychology piece, I think there'd be a big missing. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. I started that certification, didn't have the money, borrowed the money and um, started that. And then I learned a lot through that because I had a massive psychology piece to it, a spirituality piece too, which was the first time I was introduced to that type of, you know, healing journey, like more spiritual and kind of more energy and stuff. So yep. it was very holistic. It's a great program, a very holistic way to learn and also emphasizing the science of nutrition. So then I kind of started my health coaching business before I was fully recovered. I just started and I started kind of, I want to say diety. It was definitely like not weight loss, but it was still very much engrossed in diet culture because I was still, you know, I can't do something unless I've grown into it first. So I started my business about two years in. So when I was about 32, started my podcast. So if anyone goes to the very, very like first, oh my God. I was considering deleting them, but it's all part of my journey. You know, the very first podcast that I ever did. Yeah. Which my podcast was called something different then. And then I just progressed from there. And then I started to feel disaligned with health, generic health coaching. Started to really understand Tabitha's work. There was an incredible lady who unfortunately doesn't do this anymore. Have you heard of Isabel Fox and Duke? Yeah, yeah. I know Isabel. Yes. Isabel, she doesn't do the eating stuff anymore and the... uh, I think she's gone into Bitcoin. Is is yeah. what I what I know. But yeah, I I'll, I did her her program back in the day. I think I was actually one of the guest lecturers on for, for one of the things in her programs mm-hmm. when it came out. So, yes, yes. you were because I've done the program. <laughs> yes, I remember now. So I had her as my mentor. She was my coach as well. I learned a ton through her. Yep. Um, and I hired like body image coaches. So from my certification, from me starting my generic health coaching business and not really knowing what I was doing, I then, as you can see, like started to invest in coaches that were more aligned with true recovery yep. and just brought everything what I'd learned from them, including all the spiritual stuff that I'd learned, not necessarily brought in a spiritual context because not everyone aligns with that and that's okay. But the bigger lessons, for example, like the Buddha says, the greatest form of suffering is attachment. So yeah. I would, you know, use that context and share that in my work to do with body image and what your food looks like and how that causes suffering. And I just brought all of this stuff that I continue to learn together. And yeah. that's how I serve my clients now. So I've had my podcast for, I think, three years now and my business for, goodness, maybe four five years now but it seems like a lifetime ago I just have such a knack to you know like books I just remember the author the name of the book this person needs to read that immediately I just oh it's what I'm here to do I'm here to coach I'm here to serve and as you can probably tell I just I'm so passionate about what I do yeah that shines through in this podcast it's shines through on your Instagram on your own podcast like there is definitely an energy connected to this so which makes sense i mean you've gone through all of this like you have personal experience with this of like i don't want someone else to go through this or if someone else is currently stuck in that place i want to be the one that helps to assist and guide them out of that that place and so yeah i think that's a great thing and i would also add at least from from what you're saying it, it sounds as though you're not very dogmatic in the way that you work and i think this is the thing i always kind of say like i've never had an eating disorder and there is some some real downside to that like i have not walked a mile in your in your shoes because i haven't had to deal with this the upside is that i don't have biases connected to what my recovery mm-hmm. looked like and that that's what everyone else has to to do and i think that can often be a really big trap of like oh i didn't didn't need to go and see a therapist so that so, mm. so you don't need to see therapists. Therapy's not worth it. Or I had a bad experience with a therapist and so no one should do therapy and this is why you shouldn't do therapy too. Like I don't have any of, any of that baggage. And so, yeah, I will read and explore and do different things and be like, cool, let me bring this in. This sounds really, really helpful and really fascinating. So I'm going to incorporate that as part of it. And from listening to you, like it sounds that that is also the case. Like you're not trying to, push everyone through the same recovery experience that you had. It's like, cool, I did these things and some of them worked, may work for you. Some of them won't. There are these other things that I didn't even know about when I started my recovery and I think they could be helpful for you. And I think that's a really, a really positive thing. Absolutely, Chris, because for example, the genetic component of anorexia, 
I didn't know that when I was working with Isabel Fox and Duke, for example. Yep. It wasn't until Tabitha Farrar and I forgot the lady's name who originated with she's I think, a Jersey. Is it Sean Geisinger? Yes, that's it. Yeah. So I didn't know that until I knew that. So yep. you're right. Yes, my recovery journey is beneficial because I've been through it. But honestly, not everyone. Everyone has a different path. And it's very clear that you're very passionate about what you do. And honestly, the most important thing is that the person helping is passionate and actually cares. One of my clients said to me, I might put this on my website. She says, the difference between you and most coaches, not all, is that you actually give a shit. <laughs> and you do too, because you can feel it and sense it in your work, um, how you're speaking now. And that's so important, isn't it? To actually care a lot. Yeah. And for someone to feel that, because especially yeah. if someone has felt so shut down, so isolated, so kind of, as you said earlier, like stuck in their head and it feels like the world is against me. Like this is so hard. And to have someone like show up and like, you know what, I really want something better for you. Like, I really want this not to be your life. And I truly believe that this can be the case. Like, there is a huge amount of power to that. And like, you then need to be able to back it up of like, okay, cool. And this is the things that we do to actually get you to that place. But I I think that therapeutic relationship where someone genuinely is supporting you and you can feel that they're genuinely supporting you, I think is integral. Yes, everything was. Yeah. 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 And so I know with your podcast, it's called The Body Love Binge, and a lot of your branding is around body love. So I want to talk about this, and like we can start with, with you and, and what your process was with this, and then we can kind of talk about it in terms of clients. So yeah, what was your process and your steps, and what happened for you to get to this place of, of body love? Yeah, and again, great question, because I thought when I first started recovery that all of the eating disorders were originated from not liking the way my body looked. Yep. Where that is partially true, but of course the stuff underneath that in terms of, well, why are you not accepting your true authentic self in all ways? And that's, you know, the childhood stuff that I went into a little bit. But body image was a huge aspect for me. Like I shared, I thought that you were born, so then you try and get skinny and stay skinny and that's the point of life. Or you also can probably marry a rich man, so then you're a well-kept woman, you know, that type of, that's how I was kind of brought up. So me hating my body, unless I was thin, or I did a stunt of fitness modeling in in between the bulimia. So I'd do some fitness modeling at some point and getting so much praise and so much validation. When I started True Recovery at 30, my body changed a lot. And I am now at my set point weight. I mean, I didn't even know what that was because I'd restricted and, and binged my entire life. So body image and especially getting to body love and body love to me means unconditional love for your body, not necessarily looking in the mirror and loving the way it looks aesthetically. It's way deeper than that. Absolutely, it can include body positivity. And and that's where I'm at right now because I've changed my values. I've let go of my worthiness and happiness. I've detached them from the way my body looks. I've let go of perfectionism all the things. I'm completely free, but it's been a journey. So body image specifically was a big deal. And I had to start with, first of all, surrender and acceptance to what was. So when I gained all the weight, I couldn't look in the mirror without feeling absolute disgust. I need a word that's stronger than disgust, like because every single thing that I'd been suppressing from childhood came up when I looked in the mirror and saw a body that I just hated the look of. And I had to be with that. And honestly, I think that was harder than eating in when the anorexia response was turned on. So that was really, 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 really hard. I think the hardest thing was looking in the mirror and really hating the weight gain and hating my body. Yeah. And a lot of people talked about intuitive eating and recovery. They didn't really do a lot about body stuff. And I was like, that's a massive thing for me because okay, I'm in food freedom, but then what if I just like hate my body though? I want something better also than that. And I was in that place for a while. Like I was in food freedom, you know, I had no anxiety and guilt around food, but I really still disliked the feeling of my body being in my body. And so that's why I emphasize it. So as I share my experience, it's going to be helping others as well because it's the same process. So I had to start with acceptance and surrender. So when I did my mirror work, which is really important, 
I would go to the mirror and I would like take a breath because I knew emotions were going to come up. Mm -hmm. I would feel the emotion, shame, disgust. I would let myself cry and just be with the emotions to start with. Yeah. That's a big one. And then instead of having the goal of, right, I'm going to practice accepting my body, that felt too impossible at the start. So I actually practiced just letting go of fighting reality. Yeah. Which ended me in a state of a sad surrender. Yeah. So it was kind of like, this is the way my body looks. I hate it. I feel all these feelings about it and I'm going to feel them. And I'm going to soothe myself through them and put my hand on my heart or rub my arms and say, it's all right, sweetheart, that you feel this way. That's really important to self-soothe. Yeah. And now I'm like, right, I'm just going to practice stop fighting because what other choice do I have? Like, okay, I can go back to restriction. No, thank you. Yeah. Or I can be with where I am at and look at the real body I have in this moment right now. Yeah. And just render to that and not like it because approval is not the same as acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. So I started in the sad surrender yeah. for a couple of weeks. Everyone's different. I had support through this. And then I would quite naturally move from sad surrender to, well, this is the way my body looks today. Don't particularly like it. I'm just done. I'm actually done giving a shit. It's exhausting to be yeah. constantly obsessed. Like I'm just done with that shit. So it went from sad surrender to just like, whatever, I still don't like it, is what it is. That's more of a neutrality feeling. Yeah. That stage went to gratitude. Like when I allowed myself to truly think about what my body does for me, like if I didn't have hands, I couldn't eat and I love food, right? Yeah. <laughs> my taste buds, like I would just really practice because I felt safer through the trauma work I'd done to be in my body. I could feel being in my body. I could feel the wind on my skin and not just notice it, really be present with that feeling. I could be present with food and hug my pet or hug my loved one and just be really grateful for having a body without yeah. liking the way it looks. Still didn't like the way it looks, still hated it, still hate the cellulite, blah, blah, blah. But I was able to be in gratitude for the body, the healthy body I had, right? Yeah. And then from gratitude comes deep love, like unconditional love for who I am. So I would go from looking at photos of myself and photo work is a big part of our work together as clients too, because it's very common. They're okay in the body. They're feeling good. Someone takes a photo, they post it on social media. They're like, oh my God, I look so big. I'm back at square one. So I would go from judging the shit out of myself looking at photos to seeing a photo of me and just being like, oh. I love me. Like just kind of, you know, when you see a photo of your mom, this is how I described it. Yeah. I see a photo of my mom and I just have this wave of love. That That's my mom. Just like a, a wave of love, right? I, yeah. Shit was complicated, but she loved me with all she had and how she knew how to love, right? That's what happened with myself. So I'd see a photo of myself and not like it, but just love who I am. Like, love the journey I'm on. Like think back to everything I've been through, the abuse, the eating disorder, little me who didn't get her needs met. And I just feel love and just mm. want to be happy for me. And then body positivity can come because then you can experiment with like colors. Like we're on video right now. I love to wear red. It looks good on my skin tone. I just like to experiment with makeup. You then start to be able to adorn your physical vessel without it having to be a certain size. And that's when body positivity can step in. Yeah. But you cannot go from body hate and disgust to body positivity and body love, like in a matter of a week. It, it's a process. Yeah, totally. And I like the way that you sort of talked about that process and, and the different steps along the way. I mean, one of the things that I will often do in terms of the mirror work is as a good starting point, being able to speak neutrally. And so yeah. how can you describe each of these different parts of your body in a neutral way? And the goal isn't that then we then talk about them all in these positive ways. It's like, how can we just use neutral language to, to describe different parts of our body? Because I think so often someone doesn't even have the vocabulary to be able to do that. And if you don't have the vocabulary, it means that when you do see that part of you, you're going to have to use that negative word because you don't have anything else. And so at least if we can come up with all of these neutral terms, even if in the beginning it doesn't feel accurate, 
at least there is now a descriptor that someone actually has access to because language really does make a, a really big difference. And so that's one of the things that I work on with clients and, and would add in. And in terms of just the photo work, I think it's also true that we're not used to, I mean, a lot of people now are used to looking at themselves in photos, but a lot of the time people aren't really used to looking at themselves in photos. And it it looks different when you see yourself in photos. Like the the, the thing I always can reference it to of, of like, I feel very comfortable listening to my voice on a podcast now. That is not how I felt when I first mm-hmm. started because it sounded so odd. I'm not used to listening to replays of, of my voice and I wasn't used to listening to recordings. And now I've done this and I've listened to hundreds and hundreds of hours. Like It feels very natural. And I think the same is true in terms of photos, especially if someone's body has changed. They're not used to seeing their body in a photo. Like They've maybe done some of that mirror work and that now feels more or, but seeing it in a photo is it's different. And so part of it can be around repetition of like, okay, I need to see more and more of this. But again, I'm seeing more and more of this while I'm doing this in a very neutral way. And I can feel disappointed and I can feel upset. And I'm still going to use neutral language or words when I'm thinking about this as a way of giving myself the opportunity to feel neutral about this because if I'm using negative words, I'm not giving myself that opportunity to feel neutral about this. That's true. And you're just feeding into the negativity. And of course, whatever you put out, you get back more. Yeah. We also, we are where our attention is. So if our attention is on how much you hate your cellulite on your legs or how your hair looks shit or how you wish your boobs were bigger or smaller or different, we just get more of that because we attract what we believe about ourselves. So neutrality is everything. I started off with neutrality, being looking in the mirror and being like, I have legs, literally full stop. Yeah. That's it for now. Other than, oh, I hate my legs. I've got big tree trunk legs. I've got all this story because everything we tell ourselves is a story anyway, because humans are meaning making machines. Most of the time, all the time, it is what it is. It's just facts, but we have a meaning behind it, obviously, because we've had emotional experiences and conditioning. So I have legs is a great place to start. It sounds a bit ridiculous, but you're right, Chris. The, if you change the narrative in your head, you change the way you speak to yourself, your thoughts literally create your perception eventually, your beliefs, how you feel, and ultimately then your reality. The way you talk to yourself is a big deal. And we also train ourselves by our behaviors. So if we're avoiding mirrors and if we're avoiding looking at photos of ourselves because we don't like them, we're training ourselves, we're showing our brains it's not safe to look at ourselves or to look at photos because of this bad thing. So we do have to, again, be uncomfortable and feel feelings that we might not want to feel. And exposure therapy is really supportive in this journey, like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. People can do this at different points. It's not that we've had this conversation now everyone needs to, from day one, go and start staring themselves in the mirror and doing this. Like I very much think about recovery in stages or phases, and depending on what phase someone is in, there are things that are going to be more important or less. And so if someone is really starting from scratch and has been in this longstanding eating disorder, the most important thing is them getting in more food. And if them doing mirror work is going to interfere with that, then mm-hmm. put the mirror work to the side and we'll come back to that when it's a more relevant time. But the most important thing is we need to do the nutritional rehabilitation. We need to have more energy coming in. So let's keep the focus there. And I know that you know this, but I just want to mention this for the listener because I don't want someone to be walking away from this thinking, right, I now need to instantly start taking loads of photos of myself. No, you're exactly right. Everyone's on a different point in their journey. And actually, depending on where they're at, let's say they're in anorexia recovery. Actually, I don't advise mirror work at all. Yep. I advise just not avoiding the mirror, but definitely not going to the mirror to do work because there's so much changing that's going to be happening on the body dysmorphia is going to be a big deal as well. Yep. So we need to focus on the eating and the rehabilitation around nutrition first, and then the body image work comes later. You're absolutely right. And also, the body image work might not be suitable for you at any point. So there might just be a different way that that might be too triggering. We might need to go and do some deeper childhood stuff first before we go to the mirror. So everyone is different and everyone's journey and what they need is different as well. Yeah, definitely. And I know I saw an Instagram post that you put up where you put on a jumpsuit that didn't quite fit. And you were like, 
you know what, my body's a bit bigger and this doesn't fit. And if in three months' time it still doesn't fit, then I'm going to get rid of it. And, and it's that's just it's the it's way it is. It's done. <laughs> and it's like, I thought that was a very good example of the attitude that you have towards your body and the relaxed attitude that you have with it. And I think that, again, the reason I'm pointing this out is I think there could be a lot of people who would come to your Instagram and be like, well, she's like, you do meet up to a lot of the standards of, of beauty that society has. And so there could be a lot of, well, it's very easy for her. And yet you still go through experiences where you grow out of clothes and that can be challenging for anyone. I do think this message is so hard because someone like you says it and someone's response is, well, that's really easy because of, look at the body she's in. And then someone in a larger body says the message and they're people like, well, you were just glorifying obesity. And it's just like, there is never the right messenger for this. And I think that can be a really tricky thing if someone wants to frame it in in that way. But uh, yeah, I just want to say that, yeah, there was a really good evidence that yes, you feel good about your body and you feel good about your body even when it is changing in a way that lots of people would struggle with. Yeah. And that's really worth noting, Chris, because a few people, of course, have said that to me before. And the opposite, I've had a few people, two people work with me and say, I chose to work with you because the other recovery coaches I was considering are too thin and that that's their opinion, right? Yeah. So everyone, every coach has their own flavor, their own energetic signature. Yes, I'm under the thin umbrella. I can go into a normal shop and buy like normal size clothes. And I'll openly admit I've not experienced being in a large body where I'm afraid I might not fit in a seat or I can't buy clothes. And that sucks too. So I educate myself a lot about you know being in a large body. I haven't experienced that, but I have education around it, but I haven't experienced that. And people do say sometimes, it, I wish I looked like you, or if I had your body, then I could be happy in recovery. And I don't want to take away the relevance what they're saying. And my internal experience, even when I was doing the fitness modeling and everyone was like praising me to high heaven, I didn't like myself. I wasn't accepting of myself. So my internal interpretation of me wasn't what they were seeing. So it's hard, isn't it? Because how you feel about yourself, if someone else says something the opposite, you don't believe it, you just think they're lying or being nice yeah. or whatever. So knowing that I've grown through my own challenges, regardless of what other people see, it was my own challenges. And now that I'm not afraid of weight gain, which I never thought I would ever say in my entire life, but it's true, I am not afraid of weight gain That's true recovery because my body might change as I'm older, as it, you know, who knows? Not being afraid of weight gain and then actually gaining weight and being fine with that, regardless of whether it's under the societal umbrella or not. I get that. I'm not discriminated against. It's an internal battle and an internal journey that's the most important. Everyone goes through their own journey. Some people are discriminated against, and that's not okay. And then it's it's how to navigate that, how to stand up for yourself, how to stand up for other people. Yeah, there's many layers to it, but mainly it's like an internal journey of how you see yourself. Yeah, totally. And the eating disorders don't discriminate. It's not that the eating disorders are disproportionately with people who are moving further and further away the, from the, the standards of beauty and that people who are matching up to the standards of beauty don't have eating disorders. Like it, it none of those things protect someone. And so, yeah, I'm not saying that there isn't thin privilege. There definitely is. Like there there are definitely things that are easier when you're in a smaller body versus a larger body. Like all of those things are true. And this work is internal work. And this work is is then having you change how you think and feel about yourself. And that's true irrespective of of where someone falls on the on the weight spectrum or where someone falls in terms of meeting up to or not meeting up to beauty ideals. Definitely. It's a pressure. And even the thin people who are constantly on diets and perhaps not have been diagnosed with eating disorders, their unquote diets are restricting because of fat phobia. So even if they've never experienced being quote unquote fat, whatever that means, there's always, a, it's, this, it's the oppression that, you know, fat people experience, which is why people restrict in the entire first place, apart from, you know, childhood stuff, body image stuff. That's the reason why. Yeah, totally. And I've had lots of people where when they went to get support and see someone, and it could be because they'd lost their period, for example, 
they don't get adequate support because people are like, you're doing really great. So good to see that you're not keeping your weight too high. Definitely keep up with all the exercise that you're doing. Like the same biases are there and, and can be then very harmful for them. It's like, oh, yeah, I don't know why you're 25 and you've got osteoporosis, but just keep doing what you're doing. And it's just, it's really maddening because it's like there is a really obvious reason why this is occurring. And because someone fits into this body that we think is ideal, when we're unable to see that there are things going on here that are perpetuating this issue. Yeah. And there needs to be way more education in the medical field for sure. Yeah. Because like I was saying, I mean, I look in a thin ideal, but on the BMI scale, I'm almost on the obese category. But my body is really healthy and happy as it is in its natural size. And I've had a few clients who have, you know, been to get help and they've done the BMI and they've been like, actually, you're in the overweight category. So keep restricting. And, and it's just like, oh, my, if only they knew yes. how damaging that was. Because doctors are there to help people, right? They're not doing it on purpose. Yeah. We need a lot more education into the medical industry, definitely around eating disorders. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so one of the other things I wanted to talk about is because you obviously experience so much with binging and, and binging and purging, is ways to deal with this and, and how you're advising ways to deal with this with your clients. Because I, I, I think I said this to you before we, we started recording, so often I'll get feedback of like, oh, the work that you do is obviously just with people who have anorexia because of the way that you talk about restriction or the way that you talk about needing nutritional rehabilitation. Like, obviously, this doesn't apply to me because I have bulimia or it doesn't apply to me because I have binge eating disorder. And my take on this is like, no, this applies to everyone. Like, restriction is the heart of, of all eating disorders. And so, yeah, I would love to go through some of this with you. So if someone is having episodes where they're binging, what do you think in terms of keeping binge foods in the house? Like what is the advice that you are recommending connected to this with your clients? And I know there can be different stages that people are at. And so maybe it will depend, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I have two different suggestions and I did one for myself and then sometimes this doesn't work for people. So I'll share both. My yeah. first suggestion is to always have your quote unquote binge foods in the house in excess though and there's a reason for this so for example I used to binge on jars of Nutella you've probably heard me say it. I literally used to put it in the microwave and drink the whole like 750 milliliter jar of Nutella I'm not shitting you when I started true recovery like with Isabel Fox and Duke like with her method yeah I well and this was a kind of a Victorian method because Isabel doesn't recommend this actually but when I didn't have it in the house I felt too panicky that it wasn't there I yep. would then go out and buy it like I used to and binge on it anyway. So the behavior didn't change. So I thought, right, I'm going to buy like seven jars of Nutella. So even if someone paid me to drink them all, I couldn't. Yeah. So for me, that created such an abundant environment and an abundant mindset. And it helped me to tune into my body. Now, when I say that I'm talking about intuitive eating here, I do not recommend intuitive eating for anorexia recovery because the migration response stops you from tuning into your body and listening, right? So those that don't have the migration response switched on for anorexia, who actually have hunger signals and are, and are connected to hunger, mental and physical hunger, I recommend just tuning in and listening and eating unrestrictedly. So yeah. when I had an ample amount of jars of Nutella, I was then able to just completely be like, well, I'm just going to have some and if I want some more, there's enough there. And I naturally got in tune with my body and how much I wanted. And quite quickly, I went from drinking a whole 750 millimeter jar to just having a few spoonfuls because yeah. I allowed, that's the key, the allowance. I allowed myself to have as much as I wanted. It was physically in my environment so I could see that there was enough. I practicing letting go of the mindset of, if I eat it all today, then I'll start again tomorrow. That's why I had it in excess because I physically couldn't eat it all today. Yeah. Really supported me. Some clients that feels too overwhelming for, yep. and it might not work in their household. So then I suggest, okay, you don't have to have your binge foods in the house. However, you need to make a promise to yourself and to me that if you want chocolate or ice cream, you will go out and get it for yourself. 
knowing that you can buy as much as you want, you can have it tomorrow if you want. It doesn't matter how much you eat. It matters that you are coming from an abundant place of like, you can have it tomorrow also. You don't have to eat it all today unless you want to. So any way that you can create an allowance mindset and the freedom without restricting ever again, and then things really start to shift from there. Yeah, no, it's, and I, I like that there's different options available with this because I think when I think of the clients I work with, yeah, different things have worked for for different people. I think one of the things I'll often focus on a lot is what is the eating that is going on outside of the binges? Oh, I think yeah. there's so much of a focus on the binges and that being all encompassing as opposed to, well, let's look at, let's get some structure in place because if your first meal is not till midday, like it's going to make it more likely that it's going to happen. So let's have then be structure in there. Let's have the foods that you typically binge on be part of your day to day. Like when you're having your lunch, have that be part of the lunch, part of the dessert with the lunch so that you're normalizing these foods. These aren't foods that are only consumed when a binge occurs and not put up on some pedestal or they're not thought about as these these horrendous things that I never need to keep around. They're very much more neutralized of like, this can be part of my everyday regular lunch. And yeah, there's going to be times where there are going to be binges that still occur, even though this is happening to start with. And again, normalizing that of like, yeah, this is also very natural because you're giving yourself permission and your body hasn't had that permission for a long time. And so yeah, it's going to be thinking like, cool, we don't know if this is going to go away, so let's get in while we can. But the more that that happens, there is a binge, and then the next day you're not restricting, you're not going back to some way of compensating, you're giving your body that feedback of like, okay, that thing happened, and we're still, same availability of all of these things is, is still here. That's really important to have What I suggest, never rules, because we all rebel against rules, right? Even the rules we make ourselves. So to have a structure of three meals a day, like three hearty meals a day where you get full, and that's another story because, of course, we have to get over our fear of fullness and what that means. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, any snacks in between. And like you said, I started to add Nutella to my porridge in the morning. I started to have it on like a slice of toast as a snack. Peanut M&Ms were my thing. So over here, you can buy like a kilogram bag just from the supermarket. Nice. And I used to just eat a kilogram bag in one day, um, in one go, like in an hour when I was binging. So I would have them on the table so I could see them. Instead of being in the secret drawer that only came out when I was quite binge eating, I would have them on the table and I would start to practice like having a handful randomly throughout the day. And there would be the urge to like, oh my God, now I need to eat all of them and then just not start again tomorrow. Um, and I would just be like, it's okay. You can have some more now. You can have some more later. And I kept, again, self-talk, reassuring myself through it, making it normal and actually feeding myself and nourishing myself three times a day. That's a really big one as well, because otherwise, of course, your body is going to be craving fats and sugars if you're not eating all day. Yes. And this advice is true irrespective of where someone is on the weight spectrum. I think what often comes up is like, oh, that might be true, but hey, I'm not in the underweight category. Mm. I say, no, no, this this advice still applies. Or yeah, but I already eat more than my my partner. I say, that's fine. And this advice still applies. Like As I talked about earlier, you may have a natural propensity that you just eat more than the regular person and you have a, a higher baseline need for energy. And these same rules apply because I think there's always like, oh, there must be some caveat here where there is like the loophole where this thing doesn't apply to me. Yeah. No, it always applies. That again is so crucial because unfortunately, and you've probably seen this too, some therapists and some inpatient treatment centers, when the client is wanting more food or perhaps eating more processed food because, well, hello, they're feasting, they need it because you want need. They've mentioned things like, you know, just be a bit careful with the amount of processed food. Don't get binge eating disorder. Oh my God, it makes me so fucking angry because that is what causes relapses. And there is no such thing as too much food. Unrestricted eating for life. I don't care whether you're fat, thin, medium size, obese. And I know that's so hard and I'm not in that, you know, well, technically my BMI is, but in terms of to look at, I'm not there. Unfortunately, that doesn't matter because there is not one single safe proven way to lose weight and keep it off 
permanently that actually works. Not one single proven method. There's just dangerous ways such as eating disorders, yo-yo dieting. So regardless, that's when you need to be, you know, getting support from if you're in a very large body, get support from someone also perhaps in a large body who's in this work, who's free, who's accepting of their body, who understands what it's like to be in the world in with that size. But just because you're a certain size, it does not mean you need to be eating less than other people. Unrestricted eating for life, your body knows what it wants to eat. So it's trusting that and getting out of the way and just surrendering to whatever that is. Yeah, totally. And I think what can often happen when people hear that is that, oh, wow, so I'm just going to eat M&Ms and McDonald's and all of this every day. And look, if that's what you truly like, you truly need at that point, that's that's fine. But what, as you kind of talked about, you start to, to change. The amount of energy that you need starts to change because you're no longer in that depleted state. All the kinds of foods that you crave start to, to change. And so I think there can be this very, well, it was like creating a straw man of what you said of like, you're just promoting obesity. You're just wanting people to eat junk food all day. And I'm, I'm saying junk food in, in inverted commas. And that's actually not what's being said. It's like, we're trying to get people to a place where there is true neutrality connected to food so that you can then make genuine decisions about what do I want to eat and from the place of what tastes good, what gives me good long-lasting energy, what sits well within my stomach, what would be a nice meal to be able to have with friends, like all of these other things that then can come in as part of the decision-making as opposed to just like what is the most highly palatable thing or what is the most healthy thing where it's these very lopsided things as opposed to let me have some different ideas that I'm considering when I'm thinking about what to eat that are influenced by these different categories. It happens naturally because allowance creates space for choice. Mm -hmm. We cannot choose nourishment for it because I want to be in a healthy, well-functioned, fit body. Not everyone wants to, and that's completely fine. I want to feel good, like with my digestion, with my energy. So because I no longer restrict and I'm not afraid of restriction or impending restriction, I have the space and the allowance because I allow anything I want to be like, hmm, what do I want to eat? Nourishment and pleasure is what the two things that I go for when I eat. So I want to eat vegetables because I know they're really supportive for my body and I want to taste something delicious that might support my emotional health. So it's not really a thing you think about, though. You have some thought to it, but it happens very naturally. And like I said to you, that time where I'd eaten chocolate for months and I felt physically shit, as you can imagine, because I'd got no protein, no fiber, but I kept allowing the chocolate, but I didn't understand about emotional restriction then. That was a big deal. And I was emotionally restricting, which was causing me to eat more chocolate. But I kept allowing when I just surrendered to it and thought, you know what, fuck it, this is just how I eat. That's when I was like, I really fancy like a green shake. And then I was like, oh my God, is that diety? Yeah, which is so common for that thought to, to come in. Yeah. It shows as a part of you, a part of you or the person that is afraid of that, that loves themselves so much that they don't want them to go back to restrictions. That's a really nice thing to notice. And diet culture don't own vegetables or green shakes. You know, as Isabel says, dieting isn't an action. It's a state of mind. Yeah. When you're in recovery or recovered or whatever, where you are, if your intention behind having a green shake or a, I don't know, a jacket potato instead of a pizza, if you just feel like you want that intuitively, that's not restriction. If you think you should have that, that's restriction. Then do the opposite, therefore. But all of this kind of balanced nourished eating happens naturally when we allow unrestricted eating, which doesn't make sense, but I've experienced it myself. It's kind of unbelievable, really. Yeah, I actually think it does. It it does make sense that, yeah, when you were able to do that, you were able to be much more objective in terms of your decision making and also truly subjective in terms of noticing, okay, this thing does really work for me or this thing does really taste enjoyable or it tasted enjoyable up to that point and then I'm kind of done with it. And so, yeah, yeah, it does make sense when people are are truly able to, to allow themselves. Yeah, allowance is always the key. Yes, 
Definitely. Well, look, Victoria, this has been an awesome conversation. I'm looking through my list and we've kind of barely scratched the surface of all the things that I'd written down. But yeah, I know people are going to get a ton out of this. The final question I have for you is where can people go if they want to find out more about you and about your work? Yeah. So easy place is my website, victoriaclansman.com. And that has my Instagram, YouTube um, podcast on there. And that's called The Body Love Binge. Yeah. So you can find me on social media, Instagram and Facebook, I'm active on. And my podcast, I'd love to see you there. Any question, just ask me. I always reply to the DMs myself. So you usually get a voice note with them and be answering your question. Well, thank you for allowing me space to share, Chris. It's been a, an honor to be able to share my story and give insights. Nice. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you've come on and I will put all those links in the show notes. And yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Oh, one last thing may I share? It's just yeah, sure. um, I'm offering um, a free taste test so they can try out my paid group coaching completely for free for 12 days. So they can get that from my website too. So they can get to know me a bit better, experience coaching with me, start going through the modules. That's really beneficial for those to do as well. Perfect. I will put that in the show notes as well. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So that was my interview with Victoria Kleinsman. She is such an incredible example that full recovery is possible and there is so much good stuff that was in this episode. So I hope you really enjoyed it. One thing I want to mention just before I go is I have a free mini course that you can sign up to and this is looking at the first five steps to taking your recovery. And while this may sound like it is only for those at the very beginning of recovery, this is not true. Many people who've been working on their recovery for years have signed up and have said just how beneficial it is. So I've added a link for the sign up for this on the show notes page. And so you can go to 7-health.com forward slash 294 and you can sign up there. So that is it for this episode. I will catch you again next week.